Northern Ireland just for a time. But notice an improvement coming in from the west as the rain clears towards the east. Still lingering on towards the more southern areas, outbreaks of rain continue and they will pep up as we head through the latter part of the day. Elsewhere, though, some brighter skies, Aberdeenshire down towards Northumberland, Derry as well as Antrim seeing some brighter weather to end the day. Now through Thursday evening and overnight, that rain, particularly across more western parts of the country, pushes ever northwards. The air remains mild wherever you are and further rain returns to Wales as well as the west country later. Spits and spots further east through the latter part of the night, we hang on to some drier weather across the far north of Scotland. That's where the lowest temperatures will be overnight. But it will be a mild start to the last day of 2021. Yes, some rain first thing and some stronger winds. But notice the rain will wane as we head through the morning and into the afternoon. Still lingering on across northern counties of England, but certainly some brighter skies through the latter part of the day. As temperatures struggle a little bit across the far north, 9 degrees Celsius here, but still mild further south. And a bright, breezy and mild start to 2022. Bye-bye. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. <laughs> My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panellists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints were over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Tonight on Farage, I've not yet had the booster. A medical expert is going to try and convince me that I am wrong. We'll look at Mark Drakeford's restrictions in Wales. No wonder they're all crossing the Severn Bridge on New Year's Eve. And joining me on Talking Pints tonight, former diplomat and chairman of Migration Watch, Alp Mehmet. But first, the news. Good evening, I'm Polly Middlehurst with your latest news headlines. The UK has reported a record 183,000 new daily COVID cases. Doctors have also advised the Prime Minister that 90% of people being treated in intensive care units have not received their booster vaccinations. Boris Johnson is urging people to get the jab so they can enjoy New Year celebrations. 800,000 boosters were recorded across the UK during the five-day Christmas period. Meanwhile, some pharmacies are reporting a huge problem with shortages of lateral flow tests, saying there were requests about every five minutes over Christmas. The Association of Independent Multiple Pharmacies is warning of patchy supplies following a change in self-isolation rules from 10 to 7 days if someone tests negative. The UK Health Security Agency says almost 8 million test kits will be made available to pharmacies by New Year's Eve. 
In Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon says she won't introduce further coronavirus restrictions because hospital cases have remained broadly stable. The First Minister says she expects a steep increase in cases over the coming weeks. Scots are also being urged not to travel to England for New Year's Eve, where clubs are still open. And it's also why over Hogmanay and New Year's Day, and for at least the first week of January, we are advising everyone to stay at home more than normal, to reduce contacts with people outside our own households, and to limit the size of any indoor social gatherings that do take place, so that they do not include people from any more than three households. Nicola Sturgeon. Well, in France, two people are testing positive for COVID every second. That's according to the country's health minister, Olivier Varane, who also said France had reported a record daily high of 208,000 new cases. That's up from 180,000 on Tuesday. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization's Director General, Tedros Ghebreyesus, says he's becoming increasingly concerned about the uptick in global cases. Delta and Omicron are twin threats that are driving up cases to record numbers. I'm highly concerned that Omicron, being more transmissible, circulating at the same time as Delta, is leading to a tsunami of cases. International news and jurors in the trial of Ghislaine Maxwell have been told they need to work on Christmas, sorry, New Year's Eve and New Year's Day if they haven't reached a verdict. Minutes after arriving to begin their deliberations today, the judge confirmed the trial would continue through the holiday period. Maxwell is on trial in America, accused of luring young girls to be abused by Jeffrey Epstein, charges she denies. And Russia and Belarus plan to hold joint military drills next year as tensions rise in the region. President Vladimir Putin has met with the Belarusian leader Alexander Lukashenko in St. Petersburg. And Ukraine says Russia may be preparing for an invasion, something Moscow has denied. The Russians are demanding, meanwhile, that NATO promises not to admit Ukraine as a member, a country which borders both Russia and Belarus. That's all from me. I'm back in an hour. See you then. Good evening. When I first heard there was a vaccine, I thought, wow, this is terrific. A victory for British and American science, and I have to say also a Brexit success because we were busy with the rollout whilst in Brussels the bureaucrats were still twiddling their thumbs and the countries were arguing with, with each other. And I say this because I've always believed in vaccines. You know, I had my BCG when I was 13 and it meant I could never, ever catch TB. And I was certainly against the campaign uh, where people try to stop MMR being used because we saw measles back in the country. But then a few months went by and the question of a booster arrived and I started to ask myself some questions. You see, if having the booster meant you couldn't catch COVID-19, well, I might change my mind, but Professor Whitty himself says that is not the case. If I thought by having the booster I couldn't pass on COVID to elderly relatives or friends, well, again, I might think differently, but that simply isn't the case. And now we see data saying that after 10 weeks, two thirds of the effect of the booster has gone, which logically says to me that a fourth jab is on its way. And indeed, in Israel, one of the most heavily vaccinated countries in the world, they're busy with a fourth jab and we're talking about a fourth jab here. So why not a fourth, a fifth? a sixth, a seventh. And let's not pretend that this or any other vaccine doesn't have side effects, certainly looking at the statistics for the Moderna booster. And it may be only a few per million, but there are a few per million heart conditions being caused by that booster. And presumably, the more times you're jabbed, the more chance there is of something going wrong. So I've weighed all of this up. And if it doesn't stop me getting COVID, and if it doesn't stop me passing it on, and if there is a risk, however small, of side effects, and given the fact 
I just don't want to be jabbed and jabbed and jabbed. They want to give me a booster. They want to give me a flu vaccine. I've no doubt, you know, come the spring, they'll want to give me another booster. And given all of those things, thus far, I have not had the booster. But my mind is far from closed on this. I just need some convincing. So the question tonight, for you, the audience, to answer, for me, please, is should I get the booster? Let me know what you think. GBviews at gbnews.uk. And, of course, you can tweet your thoughts, comments and questions in to at GBnews. Also send in the questions for the end, please, for Barrage the Farage. Now, one of the things that really has been confusing me is the government using statistics which quite often turn out to be wrong. Uh, there was a report today on the BBC Radio News suggesting that, that another 2.4 million people needed the booster. I suspect the figure is much, much higher than that because I'm meeting a lot of people, family and friends, acquaintances, who, like me, have got a reluctance to have this booster. Well, let's just cut through it all. Let's find out where we are with boosters. Let's find out, indeed, where we are with hospitals uh, and, and, of course, intensive care units. Boris Johnson today saying, doctors tell me that 90% in ICU haven't had the booster. Hmm, doctors tell me doesn't necessarily strike me as being good statistics. So first, let's get the numbers. And joining me to discuss this, to give me the accurate statistics around the booster, is former ONS statistician Jamie Jenkins. Jamie, good evening. Good evening, Nigel. You good? Yeah, I am, but I just get ever so confused when I hear government figures. Uh, I heard Nadine Dorries a few weeks ago quoting a very high number of those in intensive care uh, that hadn't had uh, the vaccine at all, and that, that, when it was checked, turned out not to be true. So, Jamie, let's start with the basics. How many people have had jab one, jab two, or the booster in percentage terms? Yeah, so we've got considerable numbers of people who had the first jab. It's, it's, it's approaching kind of 90% of people over the age of 12 or 12 and over now. Yep. And then when we start looking at people who had the booster, sorry, the, the second dose and then the booster, obviously it starts to reduce. I've been looking at the numbers today in terms of the booster. And we've had 325,000 new doses in the last 24 hours, uh, about 33.1 million people overall. And I think the point you made when you were doing the introduction there was about who needs the booster. It might be slightly different to the people who need the booster by the number of people who can, is eligible for the booster. So ah. we currently know that around 13.3 million people who are over the age of 18 who had the second dose have not yet had a booster. Yeah. Now, sadly, some of those would have died since having the booster, so obviously you're not going to get the full take-up with that. But I think the important thing is who needs to have the booster because with the Omicron variant showing that it's far less deadly and you know, it's looking pretty positive with the information we get from Denmark and South Africa, you know, it's the question is how many young people need a booster is different to how many can have the booster. Yeah, I mean, if there are 13 million of us who were double jabbed, who've not yet had uh, the booster, uh, despite the biggest advertising campaign I think I've ever seen, uh, you know, wraps on newspapers, bus shelters, letters, texts, goodness knows what, then there's a lot of people in my position asking questions. Jamie, when it comes to those in hospital with COVID, uh, with or without vaccinations or boosters. I think there's a slight confusion in the figures here, isn't there? Because as I understand it, quite a lot of people in hospital and in intensive care who are there uh, because they've got COVID actually went in for different reasons and contracted COVID whilst they were actually in hospital. Well, yeah, Nigel, and, and we've seen over the last three or four weeks kind of this propaganda campaign from ministers in, um, and it's on both sides of the kind of fence as well. We had somebody on the radio yesterday from the Conservative MP saying that 99% of all the deaths recently were people who were unvaccinated, and that's not true. You know, it's less than 30%. But remember now, the vast majority of people are kind of vaccinated in the country, so that's not a surprise. But Boris Johnson, Sajid Javid, Nadine Doris, you know, all the ministers are going out trying to claim that the majority of patients in ICU yeah. are unvaccinated. And the figures that we do have shows that 48% of patients in ICU, that's the latest data that we have, are unvaccinated. Now, they are slightly overrepresented, but we also know, uh, Nigel, that people who are obese are significantly overrepresented as well. And we don't seem to have the same 
discussions around those. Now, if we start let's looking just, at the hospitals... Yes. Let's, just, let's just drill back down, please, if I can, Jamie, into that number. So the last accurate statistics you've got are that 48% of those in ICU are unvaccinated. Yeah, that's the latest figure that we have, and, and it will vary across the country, Nigel, but that's the accurate figure that we've yeah. got. And we start, you know, we hear ministers go on saying nine out of ten, and Boris today was talking about people who are in intensive care who've not had a booster. I think it's a bit disingenuous for him to be going on talking about that, because obviously yeah. a lot of people may not have had a chance to have the booster yet. Jamie, thank you for that. Really very, very useful indeed. Thank you. So you see, there is a very big government campaign. There is huge money being spent telling us to get the booster. I have to say, for my money, I wonder why we're not actually spending the money on giving people antiviral drugs. We've seen great success with antivirals, with awful diseases like AIDS. Uh, these drugs, there are quite a few of them now available on the market, and they're actually quite a good price. So I do wonder about that. Right, can I be convinced? Am I wrong about this? Well, here to convince me to get my booster vaccine is the former chief executive of the Royal College of Nursing, Dr. Peter Carter. Peter, good evening and thank you. Good evening, Nigel. So it isn't just me who's been double jabbed, who we've done all the things that we thought we should do. We believe in vaccines very strongly, but we are now scratching our heads because we're used to the concept of a vaccine that lasts for a lifetime. And we're now being told to get a jab that loses two-thirds of its effectiveness within 10 weeks. Are these actually vaccines, or are they more like medical treatments? Well, they are vaccines. And just to correct you, that um, not all vaccines last a lifetime. That's why we have the flu jab every year. Well, I now, don't. But in answer, in answer to your exam question, should you have the vaccine, I believe you should. I think you should have the booster. And I fully accept that there are some people that will have side effects. But when you weigh up the balance, for me, you're better off to have it than not to have it, um, because it will give you more protection. But there is no doubt that the uh, efficacy of it will begin to wear off. But I would still say so. I've had it. I persuaded my friends and family to have it. Um, and I, I think that's the way forward. Now, what I think is confusing the issue is that there are too many statistics flying around. And, you know, the Prime Minister today was saying, doctors tell me that 90% of people in their intensive care units uh, are there who have not been fully vaccinated. Now, that's, that's he's saying 90% of doctors that have told him that, so I will accept, obviously, <laughs> if he's telling the truth. Some well. people have, have said that. <laughs> but, but, but I actually think it's more like, 50-odd percent of people in intensive care units have not been fully vaccinated. Yes. So yes. I do think it's important yeah. that we get the accurate statistics. And the other thing to say is, I well, look, I, I am fully behind um, people getting the booster, so I don't want to give your viewers a mixed message. But the reality is that over the next few days, the booster isn't what's going to save New Year's Eve because it takes much longer than that to kick in. And there are no, I get, I, I get that piece. They're not I get eligible that. for the booster. I get so that. So it's a very so, mixed picture. So if I have my, if, if I follow your advice and I get my booster, when's my next booster? March, April? Well, that's the big un, 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 unanswerable question at the moment. We, we just don't know. Um, I mean, the, 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 despite the science behind this, this is actually not a precise science. Um, we have to wait and see what happens. I mean, I'm still in the school of thought that says, you know, if we take many of those basic elementary precautions, which I've discussed with you before, yep. and we use a lot of common sense, hand hygiene, all that sort of thing, uh, who knows, you know, come the spring, we could be well through this. Um, but we, we just don't know. We're in uncharted territory. We'd never heard of this thing uh, two years ago. So we're not sure where we're going. But what no, confuses I, the public... I accept that. And... I accept that. I accept that point, Peter. Of course I do. But look, you know, there's pressure being put on people to get this booster. And one of the really key pull points that's being used is to say, by having the booster, you're protecting your family. By having the booster, you're protecting your elderly relatives. But that just isn't true, because I heard Chris Whitty 10 days ago 
saying, look, even with the booster, you can still catch Omicron. Uh, and we're seeing huge numbers of cases of people who've been triple jabbed, who today are catching Omicron. Isn't this the point? That, that, and, and I'll come on in a moment to whether getting the booster could reduce, for me at 57, and maybe not in the best of health, my medical harms, and we will come on to that, and maybe that'll be the key for me to make a decision. But if I have the booster, that doesn't stop me catching and passing on COVID, does it? No, it doesn't. But what it does is it does give you protection and it begins to ameliorate the amount that you can pass on. And the more people that get vaccinated, the better chance there are as we're getting through this. Uh, and, and there is the big conundrum. And what doesn't help is when you get misleading statistics and then the public then have even more doubt in their politicians yeah. uh, than they have. Um, and it's also not helpful, and it's very confusing, that one of the things I thought could have happened is that um, across Scotland, Wales and England, the three governments um, could have agreed a common template. <laughs> I mean, I heard, I heard, I heard uh, somebody, uh, the, 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 the owner of the horse that won the Welsh Derby, saying, this is quite ridiculous, up in Chepstow, uh, it was empty, 40 yeah. minutes uh, drive away in Bristol, Ashton Gate Stadium was uh, 20-odd thousand I know, people. I know. This, that, it, it, was, totally it was actually confusing. it was actually the Welsh Grand National. That minor correction, uh, but I did feel very what, sorry. What for the, You said the derby, but it's all right. Um, oh, sorry, but, I, sorry. but as you say, they, they could have been a crowd there, gathered space, and I felt very sorry for, for the winners of the Grand National. Now, look, here's the big one. Here's the big one, uh, because, Peter, I'm not convinced that I should get the booster in terms of stopping me getting COVID at all. I'm not convinced I should get it in terms of me being at risk as a spreader. And those things do not convince me at all. But I guess the big one is, uh, and by the way, Boris Johnson using that figure of 90% today has actually done more damage, I think, to the booster mm. campaign than anything else. Very it's unfortunate. Not, yeah, yeah it, well, it's, it, it's typical Boris Johnson, but it's not a credible figure. It's just not true. But here's the one I want to ask you, all right? If I get this booster and then contract COVID, am I really, genuinely, seriously likely to be less ill? Yes, you are. I'm absolutely convinced of that. I wouldn't have had it myself. I wouldn't be recommending it to my friends and family. I think it's overwhelming that it definitely does help. But it is not, as Chris Whitty says, it is not a panacea to cure all ills associated with this virus. But I would honestly encourage your viewers to have this. I would encourage you to have it, Nigel, um, and it will help us move forward. But we've got lots of other things in relation to that. I mean, um, your previous Mr Jenkins, I mean, he was right when he said, look at the people with massive obesity problems yeah. that uh, get COVID and, sure. and are in a bad way because of that. And the other yeah. issue is that about the number of people admitted to hospital, um, many of them discover they've got COVID, and they've been admitted for something else uh, because they're asymptomatic. So it's a very confusing uh, situation. If we could get a series of honest statistics out, I think it would uh, help the public to be more yeah. confident. I agree. If people say, please have it. I agree. And it would also allow them to sensibly make their own decisions. Peter Carter, thank you very much for coming on and arguing the case in favour of the booster. Well, that last point is the one that I am going to have a really serious think about. As I say, my reluctance to have the booster thus far is not on any ideological grounds. It's just that I'm reluctant to keep being jabbed. I'm going to think about that. In a moment, we'll discuss Wales's recent COVID restrictions. Are they necessary or are they, frankly, just plain bonkers? It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello there. Another mild day tomorrow, still windy with some spells of rain, but some brighter breaks, particularly to the lee of higher ground towards the northeast. Low pressure firmly in charge. However, it's the wind direction which is determining how high the temperatures will be tomorrow. And we could see values coming in around 12 to 15 degrees Celsius, but it will be windy everywhere. 
and a breezy night tonight. Further spells of cloud and rain pushing up from the southwest, and this rain could turn heavy across the Midlands, uh, Wales, northwest England. Further spells of rain for the north and the west of Scotland, particularly over the higher ground, we could see some high rainfall totals. All in all, it's a windy end to the night, a mild one. Also, we'll see further spells of rain. So a wet start to the day, particularly for England and Wales and Scotland. Rain clipping the far north of Northern Ireland just for a time. But notice an improvement coming in from the west as the rain clears towards the east. Still lingering on towards the more southern areas. Outbreaks of rain continue and they will pep up as we head through the latter part of the day. Elsewhere, though, some brighter skies. Aberdeenshire down towards Northumberland. Derry as well as Antrim seeing some brighter weather to end the day. Now through Thursday evening and overnight, that rain, particularly across more western parts of the country, pushes ever northwards. The air remains mild wherever you are and further rain returns to Wales as well as the west country later. Spits and spots further east through the latter part of the night, we hang on to some drier weather across the far north of Scotland. That's where the lowest temperatures will be overnight. But it will be a mild start to the last day of 2021. Yes, some rain first thing and some stronger winds. But notice the rain will wane as we head through the morning and into the afternoon. Still lingering on across northern counties of England, but certainly some brighter skies through the latter part of the day. As temperatures struggle a little bit across the far north, 9 degrees Celsius here, but still mild further south. And a bright, breezy and mild start to 2022. Bye-bye. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Join us for Political Correction. We're here every Sunday to correct politics and put you, the people, back in charge. We talk about all areas of the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland. Our debate goes way beyond the Westminster Village. It's about the real country. It's about your opinion. So please, we want you to tell us what you think. This is Political Correction. Every Sunday morning from 10 a.m. here on GB News. You're watching GB News Live across the UK, the world and our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We're here for you. Don't forget to join our community by hitting the subscribe button. And download the GB News app so you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you. Email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk. Thanks for being part of the GB News family. Well, that really was a very interesting debate around boosters and all sides of the argument there rubbishing 
the Prime Minister for saying what he said this morning. Doctors tell me 90% of those in intensive care have not had the booster. Mr Johnson, you really must do better if you want the public to trust you. Now, should I get this booster following that discussion? Some audience reaction. Peter says, I'd be worried about vaccine dependency and the demise of our natural immune system. That point has been made to me before. Patrick says, it's your personal choice, Nigel. I can't stand people telling others what they should do. No, nor can I. And Karen says, well, it really depends on whether you want to be jabbed every three months for the rest of your life. Well, that's a little bit of my reluctance. And it was interesting, wasn't it? What I said, well, vaccines last for a lifetime. And Peter Carlos said, oh, no, 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 the flu jab doesn't. Well, that's actually why I don't have the flu jab. And finally, Luke says, the booster isn't about reducing spread of the virus. No, I've got that. It's about reducing the risk of hospitalisation and severe illness. Yes, I think that is right, uh, which is why I really am appalled at these constant advertising messages saying, get the booster to protect the rest of your family, because it just isn't the case. Now, take a look at this picture of this man and tell me if you know who he is. There he is. Yes, it's Mark Drakeford. I know most of you at home couldn't pick him out of a lineup, but believe it or not, this man is the First Minister of Wales and determined at every twist and turn to show, just like Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland, that he actually is the real boss in Wales and he's tough and he's going to be very different to Boris Johnson. And so he's introduced from Boxing Day a series of restrictions because Omicron to him is deadly serious. In fact, he has said that Omicron is as serious as the Delta variant, which, Mr Drakeford, it is not. Anyway, these are the restrictions that are coming in Wales. You must work from home or face a fine of £60. Yes, you can be fined in Wales £60 for going to the office if it's non-essential work. But you can go to the pub with a maximum of six people, but in the pub you must be socially distanced, ideally by two metres. So if you want to talk to somebody over the course of lunch in the pub, you best take a loud hailer with you. It's a maximum of 50 people for outdoor events. We discussed a moment ago the fact that the Welsh Grand National was run in front of 50 people and 30 can meet in your house. All nightclubs are closed and the isolation period is 10 days. We've reduced it to seven days in the United Kingdom. They're reducing it to five days in the United States of America. And I'm guessing in England we will do that fairly soon. And it just strikes me as being completely extraordinary. Yes, we know that Omicron is spreading very, very quickly indeed. But these restrictions are crazy. And that's why there's going to be a flood of people coming over the Severn Bridge, going to Bristol, and I've no doubt up in Shrewsbury and other places close to the Welsh border. Similarly, I suspect Newcastle and Manchester are going to do very, very well on New Year's Eve as people leave Scotland. Strikes me these restrictions are crackers. We did ask the Welsh Government for a response. Omicron is a fast-moving, highly infectious form of coronavirus, etc, etc, etc. Well, joining me to discuss all of this and what this might be doing to the Welsh economy is Conservative Senate member James Evans. James, um, has this man Drakeford completely lost the plot? Has power gone to his head? Well, it's good evening and good to be with you, Nigel, today. But uh, I'll be honest with you, I think the whole of the Welsh nation is completely baffled by the restrictions that Mark Drakeford has imposed. But it's it's not a shock, really. This is the first major senior Labour figure that come out to back Jeremy Corbyn. 
this you know this just tells you all you need to know about his style of politics it is extreme socialism it's all about control and not giving anybody their freedoms back this man has no idea of business he's been in the public sector all his life he was a university lecturer then he went on to be a special advisor for the then first minister rodri morgan to become yes. health minister with part of the government when he became an assembly member and every department he has touched has had major failure in it and what labor have done they promoted somebody to the top job to run the country that's got a history of failure so it's it's not surprising but it's not good for the welsh economy and it's not good for britain no, and it's not good for the standing of Wales. I mean, Rodri Morgan, uh, you may have disagreed with Rodri Morgan politically, you know, an old Labour man to his fingertips, but actually, as First Minister of Wales, did bring a great degree of dignity and leadership to the job. And I think all sides would agree with that. Uh, but this guy, uh, yeah, as you say, not a great background, not a great history, and yet, is he the best that Labour have got? Well, I don't think so. I think there's some very good people in Labour, but unfortunately at the time, as you know as well as I do, when a certain faction were running the Labour Party, they were hell-bent on getting their version of Jeremy Corbyn here in Wales and be that sort of a warning to the rest of the UK. Look, if you want to ever wonder what it would have been like under a premiership under Jeremy Corbyn, come and have a look in Wales. It's <laughs> petrifying. You've got people on waiting you've got people on waiting lists and I on a serious point here who are living off the strongest type of medication you can be prescribed just to get up in the morning. I'm being contacted by pubs and businesses right across Wales who tell me that they're struggling because they're switching on, switching off of regulation and restrictions all the time. It's bad for business. But as we said, it's not, it's not, it's not to be sort of looked at because the First Minister himself has never run a business. He doesn't understand about no. paying people's wages, about employing people. The, the, the man is just drunk on his own power at the moment. And does it? Does it? Let me ask you, James. And, you know, you're a member of the Senate, the Welsh Assembly, or Welsh Parliament, as they now call it. Does all of this raise some quite serious questions. I mean, has devolution turned into a dog's dinner? The problem with we've got now, we've had the same party running Wales for 22 years or 23 years now. Wales needs a change. You know, when you talk about the restrictions, let's look at some of the figures which we have in Wales. 73% down in hospital admissions from this point last year. Mark Drakeford cut hospital beds in Wales this year. If he was that concerned about any COVID variants, why did he cut beds in Wales? Wow. That's a question which the Welsh Government won't answer. No. And only two people have tragically lost their lives this week in a hospital because of COVID-19. I'm afraid when Mark Drakeford was bringing out all his rules and restrictions, he said, we're following the science. I'm doing it to keep Wales safe. But when he recalled us no more than last last week to tell us about all these new bonkers restrictions. There was no science and there's no evidence and he still hasn't well, come forward with anything to well, prove why these measures should be brought in, in the first place. And James, will you be crossing the border to celebrate New Year's Eve? I won't be, Nigel. I'll be spending oh. it with my oh. family. But uh. when, when... <laughs> I believe I'll be you. Spending it, I'll, be spending it, I'll be spending it at home, probably okay. with a couple of Kansas actors, with a few mates, because we can oh, have yeah. 30 people in my house <laughs> as long as they take a blow test. But if I want to go down the local pub, there's only six of us can sit there, two metres apart, socially distant. It's the whole thing, crack the whole thing the is mad. James Evans, thank you for joining us. But, you know, the Welsh Government insists this is a proportionate response to the public health threat from Omicron. Now, moving on to a what the Farage moment and something that I find really a little bit baffling. And it is this. A fund of money has been set aside for rough sleepers. In total, £28 million. Pounds. It is the Protect and Vaccinate scheme which aims to increase the vaccine uptake among people who are homeless and sleeping rough. Well, that sounds good. But guess how much they're spending? £28 million. Pounds. Now, according to the government, this £28 million will go towards mobile vaccinations of people sleeping on the streets, uh, including those helping get them into shelters, educating people about the dangers of COVID, uh, giving money to councils uh, to help again provide accommodation. But just to get people on the street to get a vaccine or a booster, 
and there'll be a few thousand people involved. There could even be 10 or 20,000 people involved, but frankly, at a cost of 28 million quid. And if you wonder at any point, you know, where the 37 billion in tests and traces gone, well, this is a small little example of money, I'm not saying not being used for a good cause, but money being wasted on an industrial scale. Now, amidst all the gloom, actually, I think there's perhaps some really quite good news around Omicron. It's pretty clear from South Africa that, you know, same as there, you know, there are 57% fewer people in British hospitals, in English hospitals today, than there were this time last year. Have a look at this graph from South Africa. And what you see is that the death rate, that second big spike, the death rate in blue, the death rate from Omicron, far less severe than Delta, that death rate has fallen off a cliff. And now you can see cases rapidly falling. Omicron was in South Africa well before it was here. South Africa has a heavily unvaccinated, albeit younger, but a heavily unvaccinated population. Uh, and I think this is all good news. I feel that it's all good news. Well, joining me to discuss whether I'm right on this or not is senior consultant surgeon, Dr. Anthony Hinton. Um, Anthony, good evening. Good evening, Nigel. Now, I'm not a scientist. I don't have the medical knowledge that you have, but something tells me this feels a bit like 1921. When the virus come back, comes back again, it spreads very quickly, but it doesn't actually do anything like the damage it did before. And then, by the autumn of 21, it was gone. Can we, is it possible, we can look forward now with some real optimism? I really think this is good news. And some of us have been saying this for the past four weeks. We speak to our South African colleagues every week and keep up with what's going on. They're probably about three or four weeks ahead of where we are. But that very interesting graph that you just showed, yeah. showing the disconnect now between huge numbers of cases, but very small numbers of deaths, is also happening in the UK. And already in London, we can see that for younger people, the peak has already been reached and their numbers are starting to drop. It'll take a while for that to spread throughout the country. But I would say we were talking about boosters earlier on. Yeah. I would say Omicron is our natural booster and hopefully it will end this pandemic. So would I be better off, Anthony, catching Omicron than having the booster? It's a very difficult and individual decision. My dad is 88. He has a number of medical conditions, including a pacemaker. And he asked me what he should do about the booster. Yeah. And what I said to him was, I said, look, Dad, if you get COVID, you, you know, you're a very high risk group, I would take the booster. I'm 61. I'm fit and healthy, luckily. I'm not taking the booster. I've had my two jabs. And I took my two jabs because I was told it would protect my patients. Yeah. But in fact, we know now that isn't the case. You can still catch it. You can still... Yeah, no, 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 you're right. You're right. Anthony, we're out of time. Thank you uh, for giving us. I mean, basically, if this does prove to be nature's vaccine, that is very, very good news. And it could be, mean a great 2022. In a moment, the pub, the GB News Tavern, is open. I'm joined by Alp Mehmet, former diplomat and chairman of Migration Watch. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation, 
This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics <laughs> because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints were over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. The GB News pub is open. It's Talking Pines. I'm joined by Alp Mehmet, Chairman of Migration Watch and former diplomat. Alp. Nigel, can I toast GB News and Nigel Farage? Well, you, that's, that's a very good start. Thank you. Um, mm. Now, talking of starts, you're from the Empire. I am indeed. I'm a, I'm a product of the empire. I mean, the, the, this abusive, awful, terrible empire. I mean, surely you should hate the British for all of this. Why, why should I hate them? Well, that's what we're, we're told, that we should be ashamed of our colonial history. And you, no. you, you were born in Cyprus when it was a colony? I was indeed. And my father, actually, my father was a Windrush generation migrant. Yeah. He came over here in 1950. Yep. In the days when you could, frankly, he was going from one bit of the empire to another. He came here, stayed here for about five years, made his little pile, returned to Cyprus, ostensibly to stay, and decided after nine, ten months, nah, he said, I can't stay here, and came back to this country. But he said to my mother, are you coming with me this time? She said, you're not going to the loo without me being there this time. <laughs> and that was it, really. In 1956, we arrived on his birthday, the 27th of July, 1956. Came in from Dover, or in, into Dover, that's, that's interesting. from Calais. Yeah, interesting. And there was a little stamp in my passport, which I still have, showing that I'd left Calais on the 26th of July, 1956. And that was it, really. So you came here and became very British? Yeah, I'd like to. I am very British. I'm very proud of being very British. Of course, my name, my looks, my background, I've never denied that. I've never changed my name. I'm very proud of my origins. Yep. However, everything that's made me has been England, really. Yeah. Where I've grown up, gone to school, studied here, met and married a Welsh girl, of all people. We're still together after over 50 years. Well, well done, you. We've got six grandchildren. My school really gave me so much. And really, that, together with my first job as an immigration officer and then mm. a diplomat, was my way of identifying who I had to pay back what I had to give back. Migration Watch has allowed me to contribute to the future of this country by advocating the no, sort of immigration policies it's, it's, that we need. I, you say this with great passion. Uh, fascinating. Uh, we'll, we'll come to Migration Watch, and we, we may even mention Kelly again. But the, um, how on earth did you get into the diplomatic service? How did all that happen? Well, I, I used to be an immigration officer. Yep. And I was in Dover for, for nine years, in fact. And then I applied for a job overseas on loan to the Foreign Office as, a, as an entry clearance officer. And eventually was, was selected. The cream of the immigration service in those days would be loaned to the Foreign Office. 
And I went to Lagos for four years doing immigration work. And after four years there, I thought, I don't fancy going back to stamping passports. Applied to join the Foreign Office. They encouraged me to do it. I joined the Foreign Office and really had a, a very wow. happy, enjoyable, successful career. And you reached a rather impressive position, didn't you? I ended up ambassador to, to Iceland, yes, which was fantastic. Which, from your background in the Foreign Office, pretty uncommon. Well, I, I think I was the first first-generation migrant in yeah. the diplomatic service. Yeah, well, that's amazing. reach that position. It's amazing. Yes. And Iceland, amazing place. I've been to Iceland, fascinating history. And wild water swimming, I understand, was one of your pursuits there. I, I loved the open-air swimming. It was, we, wasn't it freezing? Uh, well, you, your hair quite often would freeze. <laughs> but you'd be sitting in this wonderful, warm tub. It, it was like having a, a huge bath, really, to, to sit and wallow in. And it, it was where a lot of the Icelanders used to do their business. They used to sit in the tubs and just talk, and anyone and everyone... Everyone was the same. Everyone was on first name terms. Even the president, she would be going off with her little shopping bag to do some shopping and they'd say, hello, Vigdis, how are you? I'm well, how are you? And she was there and how's <laughs> granny? Is she still doing well? Yes. It was that sort of society, wonderful place. It's a great little place, it, and I, I can't wait to go back, actually. Now, now you're very much now in the, in, the, in the front line of debate in this country. Uh, as you know, politically, the whole question of legal immigration, the whole question of numbers um, is something that I thought was very, very important, and being brushed under the carpet by much of mainstream media, by much of our political class. Do you get a lot of abuse being chairman of Migration Watch? <laughs> I do, but it's not just the abuse. It's where a lot of my friends um, from the diplomatic service, uh, not from my old East End roots as they were, but certainly a lot of my diplomatic service friends turned their noses up rather mm. at my it's having sort of, become part yeah, and parcel yeah, of it's, uh, it's sort of watch. It's sort of the subject we shouldn't discuss and, and it, it's all too awkward and it's all too difficult. Well, because going back 20, 30 years, the whole thing got mixed up with, with race. Mm. And, and that is where the problem lies. Immigration and controlled immigration, for goodness sake, has nothing to do with race as such. Of course, what has happened over the last 20 years, the overseas element, the non-UK born immigration has doubled. We've gone from four and a half million to nine million. With children born to those who've come here, yeah. first generation migrants, we now have 13 and a half million or thereabouts. 21% is ethnic minorities. Now, you could say, so what? And uh, I, I can go along yeah. with that. But if we're talking about a unified, comfortable society, a society where everyone is tolerant of each other, how on earth do you integrate that sort of number having arrived at the speed at which they have arrived? And, and that is really what, what concerns me as much as anything now, that the sort of opportunities that I had, that I enjoyed, are not going to be available to so many people arriving so quickly. That poses threats, risks, for the future, for the stability of, even, of our society. Of even more division. No, and of course, there's a quality of life thing too. I mean, it's... I, I remember once as leader of UKIP, I talked about traffic on the roads, and the whole of Fleet Street laughed at me. Oh, you know, Farrar's thinks being delayed on the M4 is because of immigration. Well, actually, if the population goes through the roof, uh, you know, things like traffic, things like access to housing, public services, all of those things. And the Brexit vote actually, actually did express sure. some of that. Sure. But what's happening in, you know, in Calais right now is no one's passport's being stamped to come to Dover as yours was in 1956. Uh, 28,500 have come across the channel so far this year. I say illegally, increasingly judges don't even want us to use that term, uh, which I find truly astonishing. Is it time we looked at the 1951 Convention on, on Refugee Status? Is it time we looked at the European Court? 
of human rights uh, and, 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 and the ECHR. Is it time we looked at all of this and said, these things were all written in the 1950s. It's actually time for a rethink on all of this. Absolutely. I mean, it seems absurd to me that something that was designed for a bygone age and circumstances after the Second World War still largely the basis for our asylum system yeah. that we have now. That is, that is ridiculous. But just going back one, one step, Nigel, yeah. over the last 20 years, our population increase, and it's been considerable, 84% of that has been due to immigration. Yeah. Immigration, yeah. children born to migrants. That is huge. How on earth are we going to cope? And it's continuing. Schools, housing, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you name it, it. and it's continuing. It's continuing. Absolutely. There's no sign of this Absolutely. government wanting to change any and of it. Can I, can I blame you slightly for that as well? Oh, everyone <laughs> blames me for everything. I mean, why not? You know. Well, you popularised the uh, points-based system, the Australian yes. points-based system. Because people understood it. it that people did understand yeah. it. The problem is that what they understood it to be is not what was actually introduced. Oh, but you it, can... It's Australian in name. I, I, I'm going to disagree with you on that, because the point about an Australian style point system is you can set the barriers as high as you want to set them. And actually, what this government have done is they've actually brought the barriers down. Precisely. So, so, so Precisely. I'm not, I'm not going to have that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> you, you, you are partly the reason why uh, people thought it was it was a terrific yeah, no, no, thing, no. and and it hasn't really. What has been introduced has opened up our jobs market to something like six hundred million people. Six hundred. It's million unfinished people. business. It's unfinished business. But it's what's happening over the channel that is the most visible of this, indeed, and is angering the major and the majority, and that's the point always to make the silent majority. Are with us on this. How many will cross the channel next year, given the measures that Pretty Patel is well, proposing? Well, uh, last year, you will recall, it was 8,400 and yep. Yep. something. Yeah. This year, it's over 28,000. And you yep. and I were saying back in July, August, it's going to get to 30,000. Yeah, yep, we were. Well, it's not far off it. Yeah. If it triples again next year, who knows? I know. 90,000? I, I, I don't think it will be that many, but it will be considerably see, more see, than 28,500. No, Al, you've got a busy job uh, doing what you're doing. Finally, and importantly, how are Leighton Orient doing? Leighton Orient are not doing too badly this year. Leighton Orient go up and down, and it wouldn't be the O's if they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was Al Mehmet, and that's a very good example on Talking Pites of somebody who was an immigrant to the country who now is completely a part of it. You see, we're not against immigration, we just want it managed. We've got to the end of the show, and Glenn asks me, what do you think of Liz Truss? Do you think she would do a good job with the Brexit negotiations? Well, look, uh, you know, I frankly think that I know very little about her. She's rather like John Major. John Major reached the top, held top jobs as Foreign Secretary and Chancellor, became Prime Minister before any of us knew anything about him. And I rather feel that about Liz Truss. She was a Remainer, but, you know... There's always a place in heaven for the sinner that repents. But to see her posing in that picture as if she was a member of the royal family, in a tank like Margaret Thatcher, it all suggests to me that this is about reaching the top of the greasy pole more, more than about what she would actually do. Is she now going to get tough over the Northern Irish situation? I doubt it, but I really hope I'm wrong. Laura asks me, Nigel, have you got anything nice planned for New Year's Eve? No, I, actually, do you know what? I'm going to go for a few pints... Uh, down at the local pub, um, I'll then be at home, and believe it or not, folks, this will be the old me, because dry January is coming. Yes, you watch. <laughs> Armas asks me, <laughs> did anyone need jabs? Look, I do think the rollout of the vaccine for the vulnerable made a huge amount of sense, and I still don't doubt that having that jab makes your chances of being less ill greater. It's just, it doesn't last very long, and doesn't actually, doesn't actually stop you passing on to anybody else. Last one. Tony asks, will you start a petition to stop the folly that is HS2? I'll do anything to stop the folly that is HS2. We don't need to spend that vast sum of money. It is completely, 
utterly ridiculous. Uh, we, I'd rather spend money actually making sure everybody here has got broadband and have got a cell phone that can actually work. Right, coming up next is Darren McCaffrey. You've had enough from me. First, though, the all-important and very mild weather. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello there. Another mild day tomorrow. Still windy with some spells of rain, but some brighter breaks, particularly to the lee of higher ground towards the northeast. Low pressure firmly in charge. However, it's the wind direction.